Okay, good morning, everyone. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name's Nick. If you don't have Hayden today, he's um, away and I'm, I'm filling in. And we're going to talk about uh, iterators and generators, which is super exciting. Um, I should properly introduce myself first. Um, I'm one of the people who helps uh, do things behind the scenes for the course. I run all the labs and shoots. Um, and apart from this course, I uh, teach Comp 2511, which I'm sure many of you are going to be taking next year. Um, so that's super exciting. I'll probably see you then. Today, we're going to talk about uh, iterators and generators, which is the last kind of Python lecture for the course. Some people are unmuted. Yes. If you're not me, can you mute yourself, please? I'm sorry we did this lecture on Zoom. I, to be honest, just didn't have time to get a, a, a YouTube live stream together, um, just because there's a lot of kind of technical setup that goes with it. I can mute everyone. Oh, okay. I'm sure there's a, here we go. I think that's everyone. Okay, let's make a start. Um, iterators and generators. These are two kind of probably pretty abstract words at this point. Um, but basically what this lecture is about, we are going to talk about what an iterator is, what an iterable is, and what a generator is. Those three words probably don't mean anything to a bunch of you at this point, but that's okay, we'll talk about it. Um, we're gonna learn to write some very simple generator functions. We're gonna understand what iterator invalidation is and how it can cause bugs in programming, both in Python and in other languages. Um, and we're gonna start to delve a little bit into the sort of anatomy of Python and how, you know, all, you know Python's provides all these really useful magical abstractions that we just kind of take for granted, but we want to know how they actually work and how they're implemented at least a bit further under the hood. So to start with, how does a for loop actually work? And at the beginning of the course, we kind of said, you know, here's a, here's a, a for loop and here's a, a list of items that we can iterate over. And we say for item in shopping this print item. Right, really simple. And at a conceptual level, you're like, okay, well, this makes sense because we know four item in shopping list. We look at this one, then we look at this one, then we look at pineapple, then we look at orange, and then we're done. The question is, how does Python actually know how to traverse the list? How does it know to start at apple and then go to banana and then pineapple and then orange? Um, so if we run this and uh, go to VS Code, And we'll start at for loop.py. You know, you can expect this to print out um, our four pieces of fruit. And so, okay, well, the question is how does Python interpret this for loop? How does it know how to traverse the list? So, our first approach might be a kind of C style where we think, well, maybe it traverses the list using indexes. So, if we rewrite this for loop um, in a kind of typical C style for loop, we say for i in range. Then shopping list print shopping list i, um, and then we run that, and it works the same as before. And you think, okay, well maybe Python traverses a list using indices, um, but then if we think about this further, that we come into a bunch of problems. Um, for one, what if instead of a list we had a set? So we said shopping list equals apple, and all this stuff here. We comment that out and we run the same thing. And it says set object is not subscriptable. We can't access the elements of a set by index because a set is unordered. And to kind of further elaborate on this problem, what if we have a data structure that doesn't have an end, some sort of infinite data structure? Um, and inside the cycle, sorry, inside the iter tools module, there's a, an object called cycle. I'm going to go back to the slides. Um, so we've done our C style for loop and we have this cycle class here, which essentially allows you to have an infinitely repeating list where we pass in a list of numbers and then it'll just keep going one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three forever. Um, and we can see that when we, I'm just going to actually share the entire application. There we go. Oops. Um, 
is my code name. So we go Python 3 cycle.py. It's just going to keep printing forever and ever and ever because the cycle has no end. It just keeps cycling through those three elements. And so clearly the for loop doesn't access things by index because it doesn't, in this case, there's no length of the list we can just take. So the question is, how does Python understand how do we iterate through a list? And the answer is using a concept called an iterator. An iterator is an object that enables a programmer to traverse a container. Um, another word for a container is a data structure. It's just like a list, a dictionary, a set. It's something that can be iterated over. And what it allows us to do is we can access the contents of a data structure. We can access the items in the list, the keys and the values in a dictionary, the elements per set, while abstracting away its underlying representation, which means that we don't have to care how it's represented underneath. All we care about is what is the iterator giving us? And the iterator handles the internal mechanics of how do we access elements in, a, in this container or this data structure sequentially? And how, how for loops work in, Py, work in Python is that they are an abstraction of iterators. So under the hood, when we say for i in list or for, you know, for number in list, what it's doing is it's creating an iterator and continually asking that iterator for elements to the data structure. So there are two kind of main questions and iterators are a common concept among, among kind of programming languages in general um, that are beyond just you know, Python. Um, you'll see them in Java, you'll probably you see them in C++ and, and lots of other languages. And they're implemented differently among different languages, but there are essentially two questions that iterators can tell us. And one is, do we have any elements left? Have we got to the end of the list? And the next question is, well, what is the next element? And can you give it to me? So what we're gonna do now is rewrite our for loop using an iterator and a while loop. Um, so we'll go back to our for loop and just copy that. So here's our shopping list. And instead of saying for item in the shopping list, we're going to start by getting ourselves an iterator. So we'll say shopping list um, iterator equals iter shopping list. And let's just start by printing that out because we still don't really understand what, what this iterator thing is. At the moment, it just prints out list iterator object at memory address, blah, blah, blah. What this iterator is, it's, it's a black box. It's not the list itself. It's a thing that is almost like a pointer to the list. And you can think of iterators as being like a, a sort of pointer. And at the moment, the iterator is kind of pointing nowhere. It's almost pointing to, I would say, index negative one of the list, but that kind of has other connotations in Python. Um, so it's kind of pointing in this, this, this void land. Now, what we can do is say, OK, iterator, can you please give me the next element in the list? So we'll say print, oops, uh, print next shopping list iterator. Print out iterator loop and it says, okay, here you go, Apple. And then we say, okay, thank you very much. Can you give me the next element? Then it prints out banana. And so what happens is we call next and the iterator almost increments until, until it gets to the next element and goes, okay, here's that element and then I'm gonna return it. Then we say, okay, thanks. Can you give me the next element? And it goes and returns banana. And then as you can imagine, we print it out again and it's gonna go pineapple. And then we do it one more time and it prints out orange. Now the next question is, well, what if we call next again but there's no elements left in the list. And so we should be kind of out here back in the void again. So if we call next again, you can see we get an exception, trace back most recent call last, stop iteration. So what happens when we get to the end of the thing we're trying to traverse, whether it's a list or a set or a dictionary or something else, 
a stop iteration exception is raised, which says, hey, I've, I've run out of things to give you. Sorry, the, the iterator's run out. We, we don't have anything else left to give. Um, and so we raise an exception. So what we can do is instead of having all these print statements and repeating ourselves, we're going to rewrite our for loop using a while loop and we're going to use some exception handling to understand where we start and then where we finish. So we get an iterator to the shopping list and then we go while true, try. So we're going to try it and see if it works, see if it raises an exception. Item equals next shopping list, um, print item. And then if we come across a stop iteration, that means we've reached the end of the data structure and we just break. And so if we run this again, oops, list object up. Now notice what we got here. We said, we tried to call next on the shopping list itself, but it said type error, list object is not an iterator. And this is an important distinction, which I'll talk about in a second. But we can't actually call next on the list itself. We have to get this special iterator object to the list, which is this black box. We can say, can you please give me the next element until you run out of stuff? So um, now we run it and it works. And it does the exact same thing as our for loop did before. And so this kind of under the hood is how for loops work in Python using these iterator objects. Are there any kind of questions so far? No, nope, all quiet. Okay, that's interesting. Cool. So to talk more about what it means to be an iterator versus an iterable. An iterable is essentially something that you can stick on the right-hand side of a for loop. That's a list, a dictionary, a set, anything that you can loop over. Um, whereas an iterator, like we just saw now, is this sort of, I don't want to say magic, but it's this black box object, which we can just ask, can you give me the next element? And have we run out of elements? It raises a stop iteration. So, an important thing here is all iterators are iterable, but not all iterables are iterators. Um, so that's like the, you know, all cats are mammals, but not all mammals are cats. Essentially, that means we can put an iterator on the right hand side of a for loop, and that will be fine. But not all iterables are iterators, which means that, you know, like we saw before, we can't call next on a list. So again, lots of, um, lots of kind of terms here we've got iter iterator and next, but concretely, an iterator has two methods at a, at a, in the, at a class level, whereas an iterator, um, sorry, an iterator has two methods and an iterable has just this iter method. What this iter method does is it returns an iterator to an object of that type. And the next method returns the next element. Now, all these underscores are probably confusing people, especially if you don't understand classes. Um, so I'm just going to do a very quick side mini lecture on uh, what's called magic methods in Python object oriented programming. Um, DAR, so is Python's for loop implementation polymorphic or is range also an iterable? Um, yeah, range is also an iterable. I don't know, I don't know if range is an iterator as well, it might be, um, but range is definitely iterable. So if we go to um, just a quick class example, so we have a class student and you know we have our init method, which if you watch Jake's lecture on classes, um, you'll have a bit of an idea of what that's about. So self, the current instance um, of the class that we're talking about, and we have a name and we have a ZID, and we go self dot name equals oops, name and self dot ZID equals ZID. Now, if we make a new student and we run Python three student.py, oops. Oh, that doesn't do anything. Um, but if we try print s, we've created ourselves a new student object here. And when we print it out, it says, you know, main.student object at some memory address. There are a series of 
methods in Python that we can implement when we write a class that are what we call magic methods in that they don't, they don't work like magic, but they seem to work like magic where they just get called without an explicit um, method call. And what I mean by that is let's say we have, you know, um, def hello, that takes itself and it prints um, hello. We have to explicitly invoke this method by saying s dot hello. And that prints out hello here. Whereas a magic method gets invoked by some other special thing happening. So what we're going to do is define a method called string. string. That just takes in self and it's going to return um, an f string, which is kind of like a pretty printing representation of the object. So it's going to say, you know, zid um, and then the name. And so now when we call, oops, sorry, that should be self.zid and self.name. Now, when we call print on this object, rather than printing this kind of yucky memory address thing here, it goes, oh, okay, I know how to represent this object as a string because we have this string method defined. And so all it does is call this function and return the result. And you notice if we comment this out and we run it again, it prints out the memory address stuff. So that's a very quick side tangent on what a magic method is in Python. The reason that's important is if we go back to the slides, iter and next are two magic methods that get called when we call iter on an object. So when we, like we did with the shopping list, when we call iter on an on a, um, object of a particular class type, this magic method gets called. And similarly, when we call next on an iterator, um, this magic method here gets called. Um, so this iter method return just says, give me an iterator to the current thing. And what you notice is the list data type in Python um, if we go Python 3, and if I say help list, list is just a class like everything else. Um, and you can see what methods the list class implements. Um, and it has all these ones like add. So this is the definition of how to add two lists together. Um, and this is what we call operator overloading in object-oriented programming. Um, but somewhere here, we've got this iter method, which says, when you call the iter function on me, I'm going to return an iterator to this particular list. Um, and if we go type iter you know, one, two, three, it's, oh, I'm missing a bracket. It's going to print out list iterator. Um, and so if we go help list iterator, maybe it's your help type. We can also see the internals of the list iterator class. And as per the slides, it's got a iter method, which says this is, um, this will just return self because it already is an iterator. The iter method gives you an iterator to that object. And the next method says, okay, when you call next and ask for the next thing, this is what I'll give you. So next is a built-in function that looks, uh, if the class has a next magic method and calls that. Yeah, exactly. And that's what a lot of, built-in functions in Python do is they correspond to a magic method in the class. And then they'll raise a type error if it doesn't have that method implemented. Now, this all kind of seems, still seems a bit gibberish, I imagine, to most people. So what we're going to do is implement our own custom iterator class. Um, and we're going to do the square numbers, um, like, you know, one, four, nine, what happens when you multiply uh, all the numbers together. So, you know, one, two, three, four, five corresponds to one, four, nine, sixteen, twenty-five. So we're going to say class square. Um, I'll call it squares iterator. And then we're going to have an init method, which is called when an object of type squares iterator is constructed. And we're just going to say self.i equals zero to initialize stuff. Then we're going to define an iter method, which takes in self. And all this is going to do is return self because this is already an iterator. We can already call next on it. We're, we're about to define that method. 
And it's just a Pythonic convention that all iterators are iterable. So you can put a, an iterator on the right-hand side of a for loop. Um, so like in our iterator loop example, we can say or item in shopping this iterator print item. And that does the same thing as before. Um, back to the squares though. So then we're going to define the next method. It takes in itself. And so what this does, this is really where the magic happens. We are going to progress our little pointer along the, we don't have a data structure here to try and kind of traverse, but we have some sort of sequence to traverse this square number sequence. So what we're going to do is say self.i plus equals one. And then we're going to return self.i times self.i because we want the two numbers multiplied together. Um, so now we can create a new instance of this class by saying squares equals squares iterator. And we can loop through this because it's iterable. The four number in squares print number. Now, what's going to happen here is we never raise a stop iteration. So does anyone want to take a, a guess at what might happen when we run this code? Yeah, infinite loop. Um, yeah, we might get an overflow eventually. I think Python handles a lot of that stuff for us. But we run this and it just keeps going because we never stop because the for loop is going to keep calling next again and again and again. And as the definers of the class, we we haven't set a limit on how, how big the square numbers can get. So let's approach this in two ways. One is, well, maybe as the user of the class, we're going to set a limit. Um, so maybe we'll say if number is greater than a thousand, great. And so we run that and we get all the square numbers up to 1,024. Um, the other way is we can raise the stop iteration ourselves. So if we decide, okay, well, I only want to give you the first 50 square numbers, we'll say if i is greater than uh, 50, raise stop iteration. Now when we run the code, squares.py, oh, sorry. I'm not used to having to put self in front of everything in a class. Um, now, when we run the code, it only gives us the first 50 square numbers because once we get to i equals 50, we raise a stop iteration, uh, like in our for loop that we did here, or our, sorry, our while loop that implements the for loop. It goes, oh, okay, you've raised a stop iteration, which means the game's over, we're, we're going to break out of the loop. So this is a, a custom iterator object, which we can manipulate as, as kind of need be. Um, are there any questions on this example? How often do we use this? That's a great question. Um, I might talk about that at the end when I talk about use cases, because the thing about iterators is that a lot of the time um, the iterators are done for you. Yeah, yeah. Talk about common use cases. Um, so we've done our square numbers. Now, that's sort of part one. How would you detect the end of the list? So yeah, when a stop iteration gets raised, that is the iterator saying, hey, I've run out of elements. Sorry, I don't have anything left to give. And that happens when we reach the end of the list. And this goes back to the idea that you know, um, I'll share the code again. This idea that an iterator is kind of like a pointer where it says, well, I'm going to start by pointing to the first element in the list or start by pointing kind of in the void. Then we go to apple, then we go to banana, then to pineapple, then to orange. And then when we call next again, it goes, sorry, I've run out of stuff. Can't help you anymore. Yeah. 
So iterators is kind of part one. Now, the thing about Python as a programming language is um, iterators are very object oriented. And when you do 2511, we'll talk about the iterator pattern, which is essentially just iterators, um, like we've looked at just now, but um, as a way of solving particular programming problems. Um, and that because we use classes and we have this iter method and it's all you know magic methods, operator overloading, all that kind of stuff, very object oriented. Um, but Python, as you probably sort of understand it, has non OO aspects as well. Um, and in some ways, it's quite a, a functional language. Um, and one of the ways in which it's functional is it has this concept of a generator. Um, sorry, to go back to Alex's question, it's sort of like it's not really a null pointer because the list. The list knows internally, um, sorry, the list iterator knows when it gets to the end. We as the user of the list iterator don't know that until we are given a stop iteration. Um, so kind of if you think about how the iterator is implemented within the class, it probably has some sort of index. And then once the index gets past the length of the list, it raises a, um, an exception. Yeah, cool. All good. Um, so generators are a kind of functional way of writing iterators and they're a bit cleaner. They're less clunky than using, you know, the iter and having to write a whole class. Um, so what we're going to do now is rewrite our shopping list example using this idea of a generator. Generator base. So we run this and it prints out one apple, two orange, three banana, four pineapple. So let's kind of dive into what's happening here. If we just get rid of this for loop for a second, um, we're going to say G is shopping list. And you think, well, this will be like a normal function call, right? It will just be a normal value. But if we print G, it's actually going to be this generator object that, again, memory address. And you think that's weird, but this is, isn't this just a normal function? And we haven't, it's not like we've printed out the function pointer itself, right? Like if you did this, you get a function pointer, but um, we're actually calling this function. But it, the thing here is it's a special function, which is called a generator. And a generator is a type of iterator. So it's a thing that we can loop through. Um, and it's a thing that will continue continually give us elements in this sort of black box fashion. And how it does it is it's according to a particular computational function, essentially. It essentially runs this function. And how it does it is it goes, okay, well, we're going to start the function. Um, and when we call next, you see it prints out one and apple. So it goes, okay, when you ask for the next element in the generator, we start the function, okay, we print one, and then it hits this yield keyword. And yield says, okay, return the element, like a kind of normal return value from a function, except instead of kind of quitting the function, we're just gonna pause computation at this line. So it quite literally hits pause here and then just returns Apple. And that's what we get back. And then when we call next again, we push it out and then it goes, okay, hit play, print two, and then it gets, until it gets to the next yield keyword, it sort of plays out the, the steps of the function. And then once it does hit line five, it says, okay, well, you're yielding another value. I'm gonna return orange and I'm gonna hit pause again. And so as you can imagine, if we print out uh, next again and again, it'll go three banana, four pineapple. What do you think is going to happen if I print out next one more time? So if we try to go past the end of the function, yeah, stop iteration and yeah, both um, will eat and you ensure, right? So if we go Python 3 uh, generator basic, it shows one apple, two orange, three banana, four pineapple. That's all fine. But then we try to call next again and it goes stop iteration because just like a normal iterator, this generator's run out of elements. So sorry, I've, I've literally run out of lines of code to run and things to yield. So that's a, a really basic generator. Now, what we can do is rewrite some of the iterator code that we had before um, to be a bit more useful. Um, but again, just to go over the concept, 
you can think of a generator as being this kind of suspendable computation where when we call next, it goes, all right, I'm going to hit play wherever I left off last. And then when it gets to the next yield, it goes, all right, cool, pause. I'm going to give you back this um, thing that the yield keyword's been given. And then when next is called again, it hits play and keeps progressing with the function. So now we're going to rewrite our squares example. And instead of using a whole class and iterator, we can just use a, a generator function. And instead of having self to i equals zero, we initialize i to be zero. And then we just have this while true loop where we say, okay, we'll increment i yield i times i. And so we'll say um, squares equals or squares generator squares. We actually have to call it and it gives us this, this sort of generator object. And then we say for number in squares generator print number. And as you can imagine, this is just going to keep going forever and ever because this is wild true loop. Um, it just keeps going and going because it goes, well, all right, i equals zero, while true, i plus equals one, yield i times i, go back to the start of the loop, keeps yielding and yielding and yielding, and we don't ever raise a stop iteration. We never quit the loop. Um, so to replicate what we had before, where let's say we only want to return the first, uh, what was it, 100, 50, 50 square numbers. We'll say if i is greater than 50, we just break. We don't need to raise a stop iteration because when we break, we'll leave this while loop. We'll get to the end of the function. Um, and then the, under the hood, the for loop calls next again and it goes, sorry, I've, I've run out. You know, i is greater than 50, so we, we quitted the loop. And if you run that, that doesn't work because I didn't save it. If you run that, it prints out the first 50 square numbers. Cool. Um, any questions on generators so far? Small side question, feel free to ignore for now. Yeah. Um, Oh yeah, I meant, forgot to say this at the start. If people like, if we we're not going to use the full two hours, um, so if people want to just like do some revision type stuff, um, then I'm happy to talk about like other concepts. Hayden's going to do a revision lecture in week eleven though, so he'll he'll have that as well. Um, but yeah, ten point two on building an MVP is startup stuff, which Hayden is definitely more qualified to talk about than I am. Um, but anyway. Uh, we're going to next do the cycle. Okay, so the cycle object that we were talking about before, we're actually going to implement that ourselves using a generator function. Um, so let's do that. What we're going to say is, okay, well, we want to be able to say my cycle, like we did before here, is new cycle one, two, three, and then print out the elements in it. So we're going to say def cycle, and that gets given an iterable because it doesn't have to be a list, right? It could be a dictionary, it could be something else, um, anything that we can iterate over. And what we're going to say is iterator equals iter iterable, which gives us an iterator to this object. So um, again, a black box that we can continually ask for elements. And then what we're going to say is saved equals an empty list. And we'll see why this is important in a second. So we'll go for item in iterable. That's called element. We're first going to yield element. And then we're going to say save.append element. And then after this, we'll say while true for item in saved yield item. So this should give us, if we um, we just run our original cycle code again, cycle.py, that gives us one, two, three eternally. Um, and so the generator we've written should do the same thing. And it does, it gives us one, two, three forever and ever. Um, 
because what we do is we just yield the elements as we first get them we append them to the saved list and then we just infinitely go through the saved list and we keep going through it again and again and again and yielding the items one at a time and this loop never quits which means that the generator goes on forever so that's kind of one um, use case of generators there are three other things that are sort of miscellaneous around the topic of generators that i'll just talk about briefly they're kind of pieces of syntactic sugar the first one is the yield from keyword um, the second one is generator comprehensions and the third one is wrapping up the contents of a generator so i'll go through those one at a time uh, we'll start with yield from essentially let's say we have this this generator that's like a death benign uh, range and it takes in what well, doesn't take in anything to start with and we'll say uh, for iron range 10 yield i so it's just going to give us the numbers from 1 to 10 and you know we'll say for number in benign range print number and it prints out the numbers 0 through to 9 Now, what we can do here is instead of saying this in a for loop, we can say yield from range 10. And what that'll do is it'll go through all the elements in range 10 and just continually yield those one at a time. And we can make this even a bit more sort of generalized by passing in a parameter n here. And we'll say loop through the numbers, or let's go to 100 and then yield from range n. So it just says, okay go through all the elements in this iterable and yield them. What happens if we yield from itself? Ooh, I don't know, let's try that. Um, let's try like some recursive function where it's like, if n equals zero, return or yield one. I don't know what this is gonna do. Oh, <laughs> maximum recursion depth exceeding. Um, Let's go 10. And it, and it returns one. I don't know what this function is supposed to do. I literally just made that up on the spot. Um, but you can get all these kind of recursive generators and generators of generators and lots of interesting stuff. Um, it's quite powerful when you play around with it. And lab 10 has some quite interesting and, and probably most of you find them pretty challenging exercises um, to do with generators. It's not, uh, it's not content that's going to be covered in the exam, though. It's just sort of a, a special interest topic. Um, so that's yield from. The next one is generator comprehensions, which, to be honest, I mean, I was, I was researching these the other day properly, um, and they're kind of, they're not particularly more useful than this comprehension. So a quick, a quick recap. I can say, instead of saying something like, numbers equals you know an empty list and then four iron range 100 or you know say 10 um numbers dot append number oh sorry i this is our, our like you know classic way of um sorry numbers that's our classic way of creating a list we can sort of wrap this up into a list comprehension by saying numbers equals i for i in range 10. And it does the same thing. Um, what we can do is we can change this from being a list comprehension into a generator comprehension, where instead of using the square brackets, we wrap it in parentheses. And so if we print this out now, it's going to give us this generator object. We get this gen expert at some memory address. Um, and what we can do is the same as before um, just loop through it and print it out and because the generator is an iterator we can just loop through it normally and what do you think well that'll that'll you know if we put square brackets here that'll do the exact same thing i can show you that so the use cases for this i think are pretty limited um but the key kind of difference is this is all evaluated in this line. So when we call line one with the list comprehension, it goes, here's numbers. And I've I've evaluated that all there. 
Whereas when we use a generator comprehension, it only evaluates it at runtime, sorry, not runtime. It evaluates it when we call next. So when we're actually going through this for loop and printing out the elements one at a time, that's when it prints out, um, that's when it actually evaluates what I is because you know, how it works under the hood is probably something like this where, it, where it's, you know, def numbers. And we say uh, for I in range 10, yield I. That's essentially what this generator comprehension is, is doing. And as you know, we hit pause whenever we hit, whenever we um, yield something. We don't actually comp compute the entire thing all in one go. We do it as, as we kind of iterate through. Um, so I imagine that it probably has some memory benefits and some other interesting stuff, but yeah, seems like a semantic difference. Yeah, exactly. Like there's not a there's not a performance difference. Yeah, um, it, it, I think it's just like so if you had a, a as you say a massive iterable like some huge data structure to traverse, but then like you probably wouldn't be using one line to do it anyway. So as I said, kind of syntactic sugar, but just kind of wanted to tell you that it exists. The last one. Um, we can do, if we go back to our basic example, is we can wrap up the contents of a generator into a list. So rather than, you know, like let's say we wanted to go through everything in the shopping list and, and put it in an actual Python list, you know, we'd have to say for, let's say shopping equals, we could do, we could use this, this comprehension, I guess we could say um, next i or i in, shopping list, that would work. String object is not an iterator. Hang on, sorry, I'm not calling next. There we go. Um, that prints out our shopping list and interestingly, it also prints out one, two, three, four, and you think, well, that makes sense because we're calling these lines um, as we do the list comprehension. So this is, I mean, this is a pretty syntactically nice way of doing it, but what is even easier is, uh, let's say we change this to say list, shopping list. We pass in a generator as an argument to the list constructor. And what it does is it goes through and kind of wraps it up and it prints out the same thing because it goes, okay, I'm going to one at a time put all these elements in apple, orange, banana, and pineapple into my actual Python list. And then this is my object. So that's one way of kind of wrapping up the contents of generator. Now you think, well, that's all well and good, but what happens when, uh, if we go to our squares example, we take this out and the generator is infinite. So let's comment this out and say, well, what happens if we go um, squares list equals list squares? Does anyone want to take a stab at what might happen here? Does Python have a way to represent infinity in this case? Not really. Um, the behavior is a bit sort of underwhelming, I guess. So if we run square generator, it's just going to sit there because the list constructor is trying to wrap up squares in, in this sort of, you know, finite bundle of stuff that's because of all this are finite. Um, but squares isn't finite, it's infinite, it just keeps going and it, it just keeps sitting there going, I'm, I'm waiting for you to raise a stop iteration and run out of things to give me, but it never does. Um, so if we put our if statement back in here, Let me run that again. Um, and we just need to print out the list. And that works fine.
So that's the three kind of pieces of other miscellaneous information around generators. Last thing we'll talk about very briefly is in sorry, iterator invalidation. Um, and I'm going to leave this piece of code up for a second while I go and fix one thing. But have a think about what's going to happen when we run this piece of code. Now you think, well, okay, we've got a list and we iterate over that list. And if the number is three or number is four, then we should remove the number. So you think, well, okay, the final result should be, um, you know, it should be one, two, we'll cut those two out, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Um, but as Dodo Max has pointed out, four is gonna stay. And you think that's a bit weird. And, and let's, let's kind of verify that. So if we go Python three, removing iterating it goes one two four five six seven eight nine and you're like that that doesn't make sense right because we loop through all of the numbers and if the number is three or the number is four then we remove it and you think like how does this how does this make sense because the numbers in the list and the the codes i mean the code's not that complicated so something weird must be happening here let's kind of dive into it a bit if we print out the number the where iterating over, you see it prints, okay, one, two, three, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And you think, well, okay, this starts to make a bit more sense because we don't ever get to four. And the next question is, why don't we ever get to four? And Yunchu's pointed it out. When we remove three, four moves down into three's place. So if we go back to this idea of an iterator as being a pointer, you know, we start out in the, the void in nowhere. And then we say, okay, give me the next element. It goes, okay, sure, here's one. If number is three or number equals four, well, that's going to be false. So we move on. Okay. We move the iterator up to be to point to index one. So that gives us the number two. That's all good. Then we get to three and it goes, oh, well, number is three. So then we're going to modify the actual data structure itself. And it goes, okay, well, three um, passes this if statement. So we're going to remove three. And the thing is the iterator is still pointing to the same index. And this gives you an idea of how the iterator actually might work under the hood. Is it probably, um, you know, as, and when I say under the hood, I mean inside this next method, inside the list iterator class, is it's probably just storing an index up to, as to where it's up to. And so when we remove an element from the list, the index stays the same, but everything else shifts down. Uh, where was I? Removing iterating, that's right. And so we never even look at four because we just we just take out three and then move on to the next one. But four's still there. And then we might move up to five and, and six and then seven, then eight, then nine. And then we get to the end, but four's still in the list. So this is a concept called iterator invalidation, which essentially says sometimes when you perform operations on some sort of data structure or object that modify it while you're looping over it, while you're iterating over it, while you have a copy, sorry, not a copy, while you have an iterator to that object. That can lead to bugs because of cases like this, where probably the iterator relies on the fact that the in, that it just stores the index where it's up to. And so when we change the, um, the data structure internally, it causes undefined behavior. It causes weird stuff to happen. Um, ran into this while doing the cold lab exercise and we shouldn't do this. Um, yeah, yeah, definitely. It's, it's super interesting. Um, and this isn't a thing just in Python. This is a, um, this is a big thing in C++. If you do that course, um, there's a whole kind of topic around iterators and what happens when you call, um, a particular function, sorry. Yeah. When you call a particular function or a method on an object, it says, you know, all iterators to a certain points of this list are in your, your data structure, they're invalidated. Um, in Java, there's a thing called a concurrent modification exception, which essentially is Java saying, hey, you're, you're doing a thing like this where 
you're modifying the thing that you're iterating over and that's going to cause problems. Um, Python being being Python and just being you know easy to ask for forgiveness rather than permission just goes, oh you know, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna do what do what I want and, and you get bugs from that. But this is just a general concept to be kind of aware of and cognizant of. And because we understand sort of how iterators work under the hood, you can you can understand why this is the case. Um, yeah, so that's iterator invalidation. And if you get bugs because of it, now you know why. Um, are there any questions on that before I dive into some iterator use cases? Oh, all right. Um, so the thing about iterators is most of the time they're done for you. And the reason we talk about iterators in this course in 2511 um, and just like generally is because they're an important sort of programming concept. Um, and they're a, they're a pattern of, of programming in the sense that they're a way of solving this problem of how do we iterate through some sort of data structure where we don't kind of we don't want to care about how it's represented underneath. Um, and for lists and, and dictionaries and sets, because they're all kind of linear, you know, like that's that's not so that's not so much of a problem because it's sort of intuitive how to iterate over them. But what if you have something like a graph that you want to iterate over? Um, because that's not, you know, there's no sort of one set way to iterate over a graph. Um, and what I'm going to share now. Uh, is it in chair? Oops. This is a um, Comp 2511 lab exercise where we essentially get people to write an iterator to a graph. So what happens is, you know, a graph is a, that's a nonlinear data structure and iterators work in linear fashion, right? They give you one element at a time. Say, okay, give me the next one, then the next one, then the next one. Um, and in this exercise, and I know some of you uh, have done 2521, uh, haven't done it, they're do you're doing it at the moment. Um, but if you have done it or are doing it, you know, you probably understand what breadth first search and depth first search are. Um, and we can use that here with our iterators where we say, okay, given this graph data structure, you can iterate over it in a breadth first manner or a depth first manner. So like if I have, if it's little here, yep, yeah, awesome. Um, let's say like the starting node is one and you create a new iterator, say starting node one. Okay, this is gonna be a, let's say a, a BFS. And then it goes, all right, I'm gonna return two, then I'm gonna return five, then I'm gonna return three, then four, uh, and then six. And so it traverses in that kind of breadth first manner. Then maybe you say, okay, well, now we're gonna create a, let's, let's keep that actually, and get a different color. Um, can I get a different color? I don't know, there's a different width. Now we make a, a depth first iterator and we start at one and then we go, okay, I'm gonna give you two, then three, then four, then six, and then five, because that's how DFS works. So this is kind of one use case of iterators where we can traverse a particular data structure that's nonlinear in, in some sort of behavior that we've defined. Um, and in this exercise, uh, it's the case that, oops, um, it's the case that, there are multiple ways of traversing this data structure and you can have multiple types of iterators, whether it's a BFS or a DFS, or, you know, you go through all the nodes in, um, I don't know, in order of you just like, you know, one, two, three, four, five. So that's one kind of use case. And that's all I have to say about iterators and generators. I hope you found that interesting and useful. Um, there's uh, quite a few interesting kind of Python advanced topics at this uh, this website here, which I'd encourage you to go and visit just if you're interested. Um, that has some interesting stuff on generators of generators and more more complex situations and scenarios. And it just has a lot on a bunch of stuff to do with Python. Um, so if you're interested in any of that, then have a look. 
Uh, and this is the, the feedback link, um, same as same as with Hayden's lectures. If you can, uh, yeah, scan it on your on your phone and, and give a couple of sentences of feedback, that'd be great. Um, because improvement's always good. And if there's anything else uh, people want to discuss, like revision wise, we can we can do that because we have an hour left to to kill. Otherwise, we can call it a day and get back to the rest of week ten. <laughs> um, yeah, Hayden's going to go through the exam for it. Thanks, Wally. That's, that's very kind. Of cool. Thanks, everyone. Um, doesn't look like anyone wants to do revision stuff, so we'll stop the recording. And um, yeah, lecture tomorrow on building an MVP and uh, the exam.